Are you diversifying your income streams at this time in your life? Are you reducing your reliance on any one income stream so you can ultimately increase your earning potential if you're in those accumulation stages or diversifying those income streams as you step into retirement to create more stability in your financial life? That'll be our focus for the topic today, the seven streams of income to get rich. Welcome to Retire With Purpose Podcast. My name is Casey Weed, and it is our mission here to help you gain clarity in purpose and elevate meaning in your daily life through practical and personal financial strategies. We do that in a couple of different ways. Every other Monday, we provide you with a long-form interview-based podcast that lasts approximately an hour when we bring on a world-class guest in the areas of finance, life, retirement, even health. Then we also, every Friday, Marshall Johnson and I, we like to get together and cover a weekend reading topic with you. What is weekend reading? Well, weekend reading is a weekly email series. That's an email that hits your inbox, one email every single Friday that keeps you up to date on the latest trends in the financial and retirement planning space so that you can make the best decisions about your life and retirement. We go out there, we search through hundreds of articles as a team and drill it down to four articles and provide you with summaries, provide you with takeaways, provide you with all kinds of other bonuses, giveaways, white paper giveaways, book giveaways, webinar invitations, and a couple of really special things. Uh, one of those being that as a subscriber to our weekend reading email, you will get advance notice of our upcoming interviews so that you can deliver to us your questions that you'd like us to ask those guests. And as a first time signer upper, if you will, you will receive a free digital copy of my Wall Street Journal best selling book, Job optional, super easy to sign up. That is just texting us the key letters WR to 866-482-9559. And don't forget to sub subscribe, rate, review the podcast. Marshall and I, we look at those reviews every day. It helps us deliver to you better content time and time again, and helps us get the word out there around purpose and meaningful retirement planning. Now, Let's get into the content. Let's get into the content and talking about good writing, Casey. Uh, I love Nick Majuli's blog of dollars and data. He comes up with some great articles. I know, we today... just need to hire Nick because I feel <laughs> like we use so much of his content. Yeah. It's so good. It's well, so good. He's, he's, he's good at putting some perspective, right? And he's good at tapping into what's on the minds of a lot of our customers and clients and people that we interact on a daily basis. And one of those topics uh, over the last 10 years in this FIRE movement has really been different streams of income and generating multiple streams of income. So Nick dives through seven streams today. And I thought this was this was a good article to kind of talk through and pros and cons and, and kind yeah. of analyze. Well, I think it's also enlightening for many. I think we don't really understand or really realize how many different sources of income that we have. Yeah. It's kind of nice to go back there and go, wow, I actually do have a lot of different sources mm -hmm. of income. Uh, but it also illustrates the gaps that we might have in our retirement strategy or in our accumulation strategy where maybe we're missing some of those streams of income that we could create, maybe even with very little effort. Mm -hmm. And we want to have multiple streams of income no matter where we're at in life. Often in our you know early years, we start with earned income, uh, but we want to add more income sources to that because what we're doing is focusing on something Darren Hardy likes to call the compound effect, yeah, right? right? We're compounding one source of income on top of another source of income that creates scale mm -hmm. and helps us get to retirement. But multiple streams of income, while well, I think they're usually just focused on uh, getting someone to retirement, accumulation stage individuals, like you said, fire movement individuals mm -hmm. that are focused on, well, how many streams of income can I get in order to not have to work as much or not ever Focus. have to work again? Mm -hmm. The same thing applies for maybe if you are someone that had a traditional retirement strategy. You had earned income your whole life, saved in your 401k. Mm -hmm. Now you're going to step into retirement. When we're sitting down and working with those individuals, we're walking through all those different potential streams of income. And you will inevitably have multiple streams of income in retirement, right. but you often want to expand on that and create even more streams of income as you step into retirement, not for accumulation, not to create more wealth, yeah. 
but to create more stability. Yeah, I love the way that you kind of backed into that because the title here is Seven Streams of Income to Get Rich, but it might not be necessarily all about getting rich, but staying rich. Yeah, well, and it, earned income is one of those first topics, right? That's one of those streams of income. It's the first one that most of us have. And when you think about earned income, when I often talk to younger individuals, they'll say, how should I invest my money? I'm like, don't worry about it. Just put it in a low cost index fund and Mm -hmm. save and just keep saving a percentage of your income. Always save that percentage of income. Even as your income goes up, continue to save more and more. But most importantly, make that income go up. That's going to be your biggest lever on your way to retirement is increasing your income, not increasing your lifestyle. But increasing that income is going to be the biggest lever that you have. Over time, that shifts. We have something that Michael Kitsi has referred to as the portfolio size effect. So as you get closer to retirement, the decisions that you make around earned income, your living, increasing earning potential, they become less impactful for your ability to create financial independence. You may already have it. You now have a large portfolio of assets you're going to need to access in a short period of time. The movements, the asset movements, the price movements in that portfolio now become much more important at that stage of your life. Those decisions become much more important. The diversification of those assets and the income streams from those assets become much more important then increasing your income. Yeah, you start talking about the pros and cons. And I think the key takeaway here uh, that I like that Nick's, Nick digs through is these may not be right for everybody, right? So the, the goal here is for you to understand your own personality and understand which types of income you want to add or subtract from your overall income stream. Yeah. Well, And then typically what I find is we have people that have earned income, They save some of those dollars. Maybe you've put dollars away into your 401k. Maybe you had a a home that you purchased. Mm -hmm. Maybe you purchased, you know, an an investment home. Maybe you set aside some of those dollars into some taxable accounts and you purchased some stocks. Maybe you're a collector of sorts. And then you start experiencing something called capital gains, your second stream of income. Right. Capital gains uh, can occur when you buy something, it appreciates and you get you get a benefit, right? You get some preferential treatment of those gains in that bucket. Yeah. And that's the biggest benefit of capital gains is that you have preferential tax treatment. If you've held those assets long enough, at least a year, then you can be tre- treating those as long-term capital gains rather than short-term capital gains tax at long-term capital gains tax rates, mm-hmm. which could be as much as 23.8% with the Medicare surcharge as low as zero. Zero, right? Yeah. We see that a lot in retirement. Individuals accumulate these assets and then when they step into retirement, their income drops way down. Now they can begin to liquidate those capital gains. And as long as they stay in those first couple of tax brackets, 0% federal capital gains You tax. can have over a, uh, many retirees, uh, well, you know, I make too much money. You can make quite a bit of money still and yeah. pay 0% mm-hmm. on your capital gains, over a hundred grand for a married couple, married couple once you factor in that standard deduction. You know, and one thing that, that stands out to me is, so the next couple of forms of income here. So what did we talk about? We talked about earned income, We talked about uh, generating capital gains. Next, we're going to talk about interest income. Then we're going to be discussing dividend income. And I see interest income, dividend income, capital gain income, all kind of in the same bucket of traditional investments. You're going Mm -hmm. to see a lot of these come from your stock and bond portfolios. So these are some of those typical early places that a lot of individuals start experiencing different sources or different streams of income. And it's interesting when you look at the return spectrum, the risk spectrum, and the tax benefit spectrum on these three different assets. Mm -hmm. Interest income tends to be the, on average, the lowest yielding in the way of return. Tends to be the safest. Then you have dividend income. Mm -hmm. Then you have capital assets that tend to have the highest potential rates of return. And you tend to be taking on more risk as you go down that spectrum as well, from interest all the way to capital gains. Taxes work the other way around too. Like as as you take on more risk, you tend to get more tax benefits, mm-hmm. which amplifies 
those returns. Interest income often being taxed most often as ordinary income, all the way to dividend income that can be preferential, capital gain income that can be preferential, Mm -hmm. and also receives a step up in basis to your heirs. Yeah, and generally, too, you talk about liquidity uh, being the same thing. Generally, the further you go down the line, if you're investing in in businesses, well, that's a long-term endeavor, whereas that interest income typically comes from your checking, your savings, your shorter-term, more liquid assets. So understanding uh, that piece of the puzzle is a big part of it as well. And I don't want to spend too much time on these three different areas. I think as investors, we generally understand these. Our audience understands these. Um, But there are some things to point out that I think we're missing in the article when it comes to interest income. As I said before, I go, well, interest income is typically the less risky of these three. Mm -hmm. However, that's not necessarily the case, right? Uh, We did a podcast a couple of years ago uh, on the three worlds of investments. I have a YouTube video where I actually draw you, you know, through these three different worlds and we can see interest income show up in all three of these worlds from the world of safety and guarantees all the way to the world of risk in that world that's in the middle. Mm -hmm. We can see that we could go out and buy uh, a CD with little to no risk. We could go out and buy treasury with little to no risk. We could go the other spectrum and we could go out and buy a high yield corporate bond. There, there are different degrees of risk mm-hmm. when it comes to interest income, even in that world of risk. And it can be quite significant from a high grade corporate bond all to a you know to a low grade corporate sure. bond or a junk bond yeah. that's generating a significantly higher potential rate of return. If you'd like to take the information that you've gleaned here to the next level, All you have to do is this. Click the link in the description and schedule a 15-minute phone consultation with an advisor on our team where you can get answers to your own unique questions and concerns. And then we have dividend income. And and what I think needs to be and deserves to be pointed out there, see, you know, the, the article says uh, dividend income often considered more stable form of income compared to capital gains as it is not tied to the fluctuations of the stock market. And I go, yeah, it is. Yeah. And, I mean, asterisk. OK, yeah. yeah, there should be an asterisk there because it, I mean, just look at the Great Depression. Stock market's down 89 you know, percent. You had a million dollars. Then just a couple short years later, you have one hundred and ten thousand dollars. So you're. Yeah, you lost a lot of capital asset there. Appreciation went down. Dividends were cut about 50% over that same period of time. So that does illustrate two things. It illustrates that dividends can be cut, they can be eliminated, right. and that does happen many times throughout history. But it still provides a buffer in those down markets. So when we look at you know, a, a high yield dividend ETF, mm-hmm. for instance, versus the S&P 500 ETF, we're going to find lower volatility, uh, lower extremes uh, when it comes to the high yield dividend ETF, right? There's not going to be quite as much risk. There's a trade-off. When you're not taking on quite as much risk, you're not getting quite as much Upside. return. Yeah. You know? And if we look throughout time, we can see that over time, you know, the S and P 500 total return has performed a dividend focused portfolio. Yeah, especially the recent past here. We talk about the last 10, 12 years, uh, growth stocks have vastly outperformed dividend paying stocks, albeit they did hang in there better during the 2022 meltdown. So you have to, there's a trade off there. You have to understand the difference between the two different types of stocks and how they interact inside of your portfolio. Mm. Yeah, you know, and these next three, I would really you know put these in the bucket of, you know, high leverage, high opportunity, and high work. You know? Yeah. You know, there's a lot of effort that go into these, but this is where real wealth is often made. Uh, we often hear you know, most millionaires in the United States were created in the real estate world. Mm. And there's been some evidence that's come out and said, well, actually today it's your 401k mm. that has created more millionaires than it. real estate. However, that just still goes to show us real estate is one of those best uh, returning, best opportunities uh, for us to create wealth. Yeah. We talk about rental income. We hear that a lot with with uh, the passive income folks. The reality is it's kind of passive, right? There's a lot of hassle that goes along with rental income. Uh, Casey, there's a, there's a phrase in here, return on hassle. I, I <laughs> love that when you start looking at these different income streams and go, do I, do I like the expected return on hassle? Yeah. So, so what's the benefit there? The be- benefit is it can be somewhat passive, yeah. you know, but 
downside is typically there is going to be some hassle. Even if it's only mental or emotional hassle, there's going to be a bigger challenge in owning a piece of real estate and generating rental income than putting your dollars into the S&P 500, right. right? There's going to be more that comes along with that. But typically, you're getting some benefits like we've discussed, right? You're getting better tax treatment, getting better tax benefits, especially if you're able to convert that passive activity into an active activity in the real estate world. You're able to create some accelerated uh, depreciation sure. benefits as yeah. well. So, yeah, it's, it's a great thing for us to consider as we step into retirement as I've said, you know, the, the benefit you get in retirement, the benefit you've earned in retirement is simplicity. You've earned the right for a simple life in retirement. And that might mean that, yep, maybe I'm going to give up some of those tax benefits and returns I could get by owning a rental property. But hey, I earned it. <laughs> Number six here is talking about business income. That's where the, the rewards are great, right? There's, there's better tax treatment. This scales really well, but this requires an awful lot of work, capital, or both. Yeah. You know, we sure there's a lot of benefits. I think people look at business owners and they go, wow, they got it made. Yeah, I'm gonna but go they, start a business. They don't yeah. see the blood, sweat, and tears that was put into that and the level of risk that was taken on in order to usually create that business. There's great tax benefits, right? We have corporate structures, we have write-offs, we have control over retirement benefit programs. It can scale really well. It can't too. You can get it wrong, sure. right? I know many business owners that have not scaled their business, they're still grinding and they're still making significantly less than they could if they went out in the workforce. It doesn't always work. There's still a significant degree of risk that's being taken on there, both in the way of capital as well as your income. Uh, when you're a worker, you can quit, go get another job. Yeah. If you own the business and the business fails, well, you may be bankrupt, yeah. right? You may be starting over from zero. So it's always something to consider. Number seven here talks about royalty income. You write a best-selling novel. You write a number one uh, <laughs> pop hit, right? I think that's the problem. I feel I feel like everybody's talking about royalty income today. It shows up in all these articles. Royalty income, royalty income. I go. I I don't know too many people who have been very successful creating royalty income. I know a handful, you know, but they're a very small sliver. That's by point zero 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 one percent of the population. I mean, look, I, I wrote a best-selling book. I didn't make any money off of the best-selling <laughs> book, right? You have to sell millions You're upon millions of copies, and you have to get millions upon billions of downloads of those songs, and you're always taking risk. I think what is... What, if you're going to go down the royalty income road, uh, you know, the author says that it's important to recognize royalty income is not without risk as the demand and popularity of intellectual property can fluctuate over time. I'd say the thing here is you can't just create something and, okay, I'm never going to have to worry about this again. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to create royalty income, you have to view it as a business. I think this, in order to make royalty income a significant income stream, it has to be active. It can't be passive. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it'll never become significant enough to really make an impact in your life. Sure, there's some anomalies out there, but this is the one that I'd say, hey, if you're trying to accumulate seven streams of income, maybe you don't get to this maybe. one and it's okay. Yeah. And that's okay, right? It's talking about personality. Which of these is right for you? I think some folks listening will go, you know, I got interest income and I've got a little bit of uh, earned income and they, you may have more streams than you thought you did while going through this. Yeah, and I would leave you with a couple of different uh, questions. One, do some homework right now, do some mental math or pull out a sheet of paper and start creating these seven different boxes, right? You have earned income, you have capital gains, you have interest income, you have dividend income, you have rental income, you have business income, royalty income, and see how many of those boxes that you check. How many different streams of income do you have? Maybe you find that you don't have them all. Maybe you find you have more than you thought you did, but I bet you can add one more to the mix. The next question being, which one of those additional streams of income might make sense for you to add? Which one is best suited for your personality and who you are and where you are in life? And lastly, it's not just about what, it's about when 
you're going to take action and create that next income stream. Hey, if you want to link to this article, check it out in the show notes. And don't forget, you have to get signed up to receive this email. So you don't just get this one article, you get all four of them and all of the other goodies that come along with uh, Just check it out, retirewithpurpose.com or shoot us a text WR to 866-482-9559. And please don't forget to rate and review the podcast. 